good or evil. And so ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, by your just judgment, we shall all die. And by your mercy, those who are trusting in Christ are justified, forgiven, and shall inherit resurrection life. Strengthen us this day in that great hope and promise that your word gives us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So let's begin with really clearly, what's the question? Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed for man once to die, and after that, judgment. And that means something really important. It means death is final. Is final. Um, there's no second opportunity to turn from your sin and turn to Christ after death. There's no second chance. Death is final. And our eternal destiny is set and settled at death depending upon how you respond to Jesus Christ. If you are trusting in Christ, then you have the hope of the resurrection. And if not, you have no hope. You shall be eternally separated from Christ. So that's that's the issue, death and then Christ. And remember he says, it's appointed man wants to die and after that judgment. He's talking of the final judgment. The question today then is, what happens to believers between that time, between the time of that person's death, somebody who dies in Christ, and the time Christ returns? What happens in between? Theologians call this the intermediate state, the in-between state. And it's very important. The Bible doesn't say a whole lot about that, but it says enough to give us great hope. So my outline today is very simple. What happens to a believer's body and soul? Secondly, we're going to look at two other texts that I often use as I counsel people in this matter and then we'll make some application. So what happens to a believer's body and soul at death? Well, first, let's take up the body. Scripture says is that when a person dies, when a believer dies, their body and soul are, are rend apart. Right? Your body goes in the grave and rests to the grave, and your soul goes to God. For a believer, you will go to God in peace. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 says, the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. The dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. So death brings a rending of body and soul. But when you're converted, when you are turned by God's great grace and you turn to him in faith, Christ Jesus redeems you completely, body and soul. Christians are not just about the soul, we're about the whole person. And Christ is about the whole person. He redeems you body and soul. We're going to sing a song after this message. And it goes like this from a creed. My only comfort in life and in death is that I am not my own, but belong with all my body and soul to my Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. It asks the questions, the creed, Heidelberg Catechism. What is your only comfort in life and in death? My only comfort in life and in death is that I am not my own. I'm not independent. I'm not my own. But I belong, body and soul, to my Savior, Jesus Christ. So Christ owns your body, right? Scripture says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that you receive from God and that you are not your own. It says honor God with your body. Our shorter catechism, question 37, says what benefits do believers receive from Christ at death and it says this, the bodies of believers being still united with Christ. 
We don't think of that, do we? we go by a cemetery and you see a, you know, a beloved brother or sister uh, buried and we think it's just dust. And our fathers in the faith, citing scripture, say, it's not dust. It belongs to Jesus Christ. Christ owns you. And though you die, and though your body is going to be separated from your soul, he owns that body. He owns that dust in the grave. And he will call it forth on the day of resurrection. He's God. He's the creator. And he's your redeemer. He loves you. As a kid, I would always forget things. Where's my shoes, right? My mother owned me. <laughs> she never forgot where I placed my shoes. Christ will never forget and never forgets you. So your eyes, your hands, your feet, your flesh, they all belong to Jesus Christ. He never lets you go. And one day, when he returns, right? Paul says this, Philippians 3.21, the Lord Jesus Christ will transform your lowly body to be like his glorious body. Oh, what a day, what a day that is for us. So that's the body, that's what will happen to your body. What about your soul? What benefits do you receive from Christ when a believer dies? Well, first, at death, as we said, your soul will be separated from your body. You'll be bodiless. And remember, as we were reading 2 Corinthians 5, Paul likens that to being naked. I don't know about you, but do you remember when you were young and uh, you had to get ready for a, for a special event, maybe going to church or whatnot, um, and your mom would get you in the bath because you were all muddy. At least I was, always muddy. And uh, so she takes off your muddy clothes and your mom puts you in the bath, scrubs you really well. You're looking great. And there you are standing in the bath naked. And she goes out and she gets the new clothes, those special clothes. And she clothes you on. That, that state of being naked, says Paul, is kind of how we'll be when we die. We'll have our old clothes, the old body, mortal body, put off, and we're kind of in a state our soul is naked because it's meant to have that resurrection body, right? And that's what Jesus is going to prepare for you. So that's the first thing, right? Your soul will be separated from your body. Secondly, Christ immediately perfects your soul, immediately perfects your soul in holiness, Hebrews 12, 23 tells us that when uh, we enter the heavenly Jerusalem, another word for heaven, it says we come to the spirits of righteous men made perfect. <laughs> Today, if you're trusting in Jesus Christ, you're already justified. You're right with God, accepted, welcomed, forgiven. But we still remain sinners, don't we? Christians, we still remain sinners. And God has to clean us up. Well, he cleans us up throughout our life, but at death, he immediately, right, cleanses you, perfects you in holiness. Think of that. No more temptation. No more sin. No more idolatry. No more selfish desires. Only love, perfect love for God. Wow. That's what Christ will do for you. And for the rest of eternity, every desire, every thought, every word, every action of yours will be perfectly in accord with the glorious law of God, with his will. You'll be perfectly obedient. Thirdly, at death, your soul will immediately enter Christ's presence and glory. You may be saying, what? No purgatory? No soul sleep? Not at all. That's all hogwash. You're, when you die, right, or when your loved one in Christ died, they were immediately in the presence of God, seeing 
their Savior face to face. And what a smile is on Christ's face because he loved you before the creation of the world. He died for you. He shed his blood for you. You're precious because of that, right? And he's going to receive you immediately in glory. And there you will await his return. And you'll return with him. <laughs> we who are still left on earth, we'll, we'll see you coming with Christ. And we will be caught up with him and rejoice with him. So in summary, what happens to your body? Your body is separated from your soul at death. And it goes in the grave. It undergoes decay. But Christ still owns it. And it awaits its resurrection. Right? Your soul, well, your soul will be perfected in holiness and immediately brought into the presence of Christ. And there you'll be with him forever and ever and ever. Two other texts I found very helpful as I've had to sit at people's, often sit during hospice care and talk about these matters. One is Philippians 1.23. Paul is a prisoner. He's awaiting his own death. So that kind of clears the mind, doesn't it? He always had a clear mind, but he's, he's thinking about his death. And he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ. That's what my whole life's about. But if I die, it's gain. And you wonder, why? How could death be gain? Well, for a Christian, death is gain because we're what? I just said, we're immediately with Christ. That's gain. And he says that. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is better by far. That's better by far. Amen. The second text is one that you probably have heard of. It's Luke 23, 43. It's the thief on the cross. It's really not a thief. He's a criminal. He's a rebel. He's a terrorist on the cross. Would probably be a better translation. Christ was crucified and he had two criminals on either side of him. And at first, both were mocking him, cursing him. But something happened to one of them. Likely, he heard the gospel from Jesus' own mouth. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he was converted by the gospel preached by Christ. And he cries out to Jesus on the cross. He's about to die, right? Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So here's a man being crucified. He's been a criminal all his life. He hears the wonderful gospel of forgiveness through Jesus. And he's looking at Jesus, and Jesus is on the cross too, just like him. But he knows he's different. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Does that look like a king to you? The world would mock, that's not a king, that's not a powerful man. But this thief on the cross, he knows that is the Lord of glory. And he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And do you remember, brothers and sisters, what Jesus said to him? I tell you the truth. Jesus looked at him. I tell you the truth. That means, that's just Jesus' way of saying, you better count on this. You can be certain of it. I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus didn't say after a thousand years in purgatory. He didn't talk about soul sleep. He says today you will be with me in paradise. And he says the same to all of us on our deathbed. All who are trusting in Jesus Christ. I tell you the truth, says Jesus. Today you will be with me in paradise. That's our hope. That is our hope. Teresa was a high school teacher, 49 years old. 
one of the most loved teachers in our area. And uh, she was dying of stage four cancer. Hospice had been called. She was a new believer, had been coming to our church, got converted, and she was a new believer, so she had all sorts of questions. And we talked again and again and again about this very issue. During her life, before she was a believer, she thought fishing was heaven. Right? She did. She was a great fisherman. Um, she played and she partied all through her life. And then she heard the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And she was stricken by her own sin. And she, she trusted in Jesus Christ. And now she's dying. And suddenly, she, like Paul, had a clear eye. Suddenly, the whole life narrows, right? You're not thinking about the next election. Right? You're not thinking about taking a final in school. <laughs> You're not thinking about how to pay a bill. It's, I'm going to die. And she had asked this question many times. Pastor, what will happen to me at death? And I didn't say, hey, I already told you, <laughs> right? She needed assurance. I needed assurance. She was lying down on her couch. So I got down on her floor. I was able to do that then. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be still on that floor if <laughs> it was Minyao. And I looked at her eyes. And I opened my Bible to these very passages I gave you, 2 Corinthians 5. Philippians 1.23, and then I turn to Luke 23.43. And I says, that same Jesus who died under Pontius Pilate and on the third day rose again from the dead is the same Jesus that speaks to you and me now, Teresa. And he says this to you. I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me paradise. You will see the Lord you have loved these last few years. Today you will see his face. I'm jealous of you. Because that's the face every Christian wants to see. The face of our glorious Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Her unbelieving husband was listening in and probably for the first time in his life he was waking up to reality and Teresa grabbed a hold of that Luke that promise of Christ and yes she did a few days after she died and we held her funeral and we got to preach to the living Turn to Christ. So that's the first application. Get right with God, brothers and sisters. Friends, if you're here today, get right with God through Jesus Christ. He died for sinners like me. He died for you. Get right with God. Turn to him. Confess your sin to him. And he'll forgive you. And he'll unwrap you in his love. And you will have that same promise that he gave the criminal on the cross and he gave Teresa and he gives every believer. I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Secondly, let's give thanks to our Lord. For those of us who are living and have lost a loved one, a loved one who died in Christ, Jesus has been caring for them. They're okay. <laughs> They're better off than you and I are. <laughs> he has been loving on them for how many years? A week, to 15 years, to three or 4,000 years, however long, right? Abraham's with them, and Ruth, and Mary, and Joseph. And my beloved, 
who had died in Christ and your beloved who died in Christ. He's caring for them. So give thanks. Get right with God. Secondly, give thanks to Jesus Christ. He's caring for them. And thirdly, grieve but believe. At Lazarus' tomb, Jesus wept. He didn't say, oh, that's nothing. He wept. Paul says, but we don't weep. We don't grieve like unbelievers who have no hope. So grieve but believe. Grieve but believe. Our Lord and Savior, he knows the struggles we have. He knows the fears that rise in our hearts. And he says, I want to be your redeemer. Listen to my promises. Believe them. I'm your redeemer. I own you, body and soul. Brothers and sisters, what is our only hope in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, to my Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this day for the glorious news and promise that you have given us in Jesus Christ. And we pray, oh Lord, I pray for every person here, whether they're trusting in Jesus now, whether they're just thinking about it, I pray that you may turn every heart to Christ, your Son, who loved sinners and poured out his life unto death and rose again on the third day and ascended into heaven and is coming back. He shall return for everyone who waits for him. We ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.